Professor Nova for inviting me to, uh, to come to Prague and thank you for coming as well to listen to the uh, lecture and one, well of course to discuss the lecture as well afterwards. In, before I start the lecture I would like to say a little bit about the topic because you could say well mercy is not really a, it's not really a philosophical topic Uh, it seems to belong to religion or to theology, um, but I think there are several instances where in our modern society mercy does play um, a role. Um, we talked about this um, over lunch a little bit when a couple of years ago um, the German Chancellor um, uh, made some decision regarding you know, the immigrants coming from Africa to Germany. Uh, some said, well, There are certain questions, certain problems that we have to talk about in terms of justice, but there is also need for mercy. There's also need for acts of mercy, even in the modern political sphere. Or um, if you think about, presumably it's the same in the Czech Republic, that the president or some other very um, high-ranking figure can uh, can be asked to uh, give mercy for people who've been, say, in prison for a very, very long time. So even in a modern society, we would sometimes say, well, the mercy seems to be some, somehow um, important. And my interest was, what can we say phenomenologically about mercy? So does mercy have a philosophical significance, or do we just need to talk about um, justice? Sometimes we talk about mercy in an indirect way, I, I think that you know, there's a very common talk about solidarity and sometimes I think what we mean when we talk about solidarity, that's a very modern, very young word, is essentially mercy. But of course there are many people who say we don't need mercy and mercy is very problematic and one of those people is um, Friedrich Nietzsche. And we can read at the beginning of his book The Antichrist the following question. What is more harmful than any vice? Nietzsche answers this question as follows, active compassion with all misshapen shapen and weak people, Christianity. As is well known, Christianity is for Nietzsche the religion of compassion or what is for him the same, of mercy. So basically, more harmful than any vice is mercy for Nietzsche. Indeed, if we follow the Christian trajectory, God's mercy stands at the center of Christianity. God, on the one hand, cares about human beings and turns to them full of mercy, and the human being is dependent on divine mercy. To have mercy on us is the most important request that, from a Christian perspective, a human being can direct to God, and has to direct to him because of his own deficiencies and guilt. The human being, on the other hand, can and ought to comply with the mercy of God through his own acts of mercy. And there are in the tradition um, is a series of um, corporeal acts of mercy, such as feeding the hungry, giving water to the thirsty, clothing the naked, sheltering the homeless, visiting the sick, visiting the imprisoned, and burying the dead. These are the seven works of corporeal mercy. And you can see this, many of these what used to be a work of mercy has now become a question of, say, the social welfare state. Yeah. Or a question of politeness. You know, that if you hear that your aunt is sick, that you say, oh, I need to visit my aunt because she's sick and so she will be happy if I visit her. That's an act of mercy. So it's not the welfare state who's doing, which is doing this, but um, in other cases, like um, uh, feeding the hungry or clothing the naked, we would say, oh, this is a question of justice now. But it used to be a work of mercy. Um, as is well known, these works of mercy stand in a biblical context, and their origin lies in Jesus' eschatolo eschatological talk about the last judgment. I don't cite it here, but we see all these different works of mercy you know, go back to the New Testament, or the idea, um, ideas um, developed in the New Testament. Jesus discloses himself in every suffering human being in the Christian understanding. But it's important to see that mercy doesn't play um, a role only in Christianity. It plays um, a very important role in Islam, in Hinduism, in Buddhism, uh, in Judaism as well. And even for, from a non-religious perspective, mercy is considered hugely significant. Most people do not join Nietzsche in his critique of mercy, 
and therefore they do not consider the merciful devotion to suffering, to weak people, to poor people, to alien human beings as harmful. Quite the opposite is the case. No one wants to appear merciless, lacking of mercy. Yeah, if, if, you know, maybe it's the case that not many people tend to be or want to be merciful, or they don't think about so the positive character of being merciful, but they also do not want to be merciless. Yeah, and that's an, an, an interesting sign that you know, if you call someone else, well, you're really merciless, you know, I guess the other person would really say, oh, this is really quite an accusation. I don't want to be merciless. And even though, even if you don't think about um, the, um, the act of mercy, whoever acts mercifully is a model of human existence, be it the biblical Good Samaritan. And I think in many countries, you know, many stories of the Bible are not known anymore, but the story of a Good Samaritan is very, very well known and survives even in total, totally secular context. You know, in Germany there is um, a, a worker Samaritan, um, Samaritan society, so which is totally non-religious secular society. You know, I believe it goes back to the workers movement in the 19th century, but they refer to the Good Samaritans so because they, do, they help other workers in need and uh, so they do good works. Um, you could say Mother Teresa is an example of mercy, but there are other very famous non-religious examples of mercy, heroes of mercy. So even who does not believe in a merciful God can postulate that mercy play a role among human beings and can also desire that human beings do not just live alongside one another without ever really being neighbors, but that they care for one another well beyond their mere duty and that they experience compassion for other people in need and provide help if some other human being is in agony and suffers. And I think you know, this is the example of the Good Samaritan. He helps a stranger in need. Yeah, he realizes there's another human being uh, and this other human, he doesn't ask, okay, do you belong to my kind? Uh, you, can I get some kind of profit from helping you? Is it helpful for me to help you? He simply realizes there is another human being in need. Um, and this stranger then becomes um, a neighbor, someone to whom he's um, kind of for whom he's responsible. So this seems to be um, supporting the argument that mercy is very, very important, and very good indeed, and that we should all be very merciful. But if we think about mercy a little more, we can easily see that mercy can very easily be misunderstood. Um, and there's a long history of the misunderstanding of mercy. It is possible to reduce mercy to a mere emotion, just to feeling like anger, envy or fear. And then one has such an emotion or one doesn't have this sort of emotion. And then mercy would presumably more be an object of psychology, less of philosophy. One cannot demand someone else to have a specific emotion. And surely one is not really responsible for one's emotions, but for how one relates to them. At best, a certain atmosphere, education or self-disciplining can support the rise of a specific emotion. So if mercy was indeed a mere emotion, there could be no obligation to act mercifully. And a merciful action could not be understood as morally exemplary. Yeah. Then you would say, okay, some people are simply more merciful than others. If it's just an emotion, just dependent on how we react emotionally to a certain situation. It is also possible to misunderstand mercy as a feature of human behavior or action that was important before the government or institutions of civil society took care of other human beings and their needs as they do now. So you could say back in the 17th century it was very important that for example neighbors or people pr in principle encountered one another mercifully. Now you just call the police or the ambulance. Yeah, that's all you need to do because uh, you know, if you see there's someone who, who had an accident or was robbed on the street, uh, you know, you say, no, I don't want to get involved. I just call the police, call the ambulance, and I've done my civic duty. So mercy belongs to a previous phase of human history, 
well, you know, civil society didn't cover everything yet, and nowadays it's a question of justice. Today it is argued individual mercy does no longer play a significant role, or merely in certain well-restricted circumstances. The concept of social justice seems to have replaced mercy. So we talk about social justice and we do not talk about mercy anymore. And I think this is first of all a very, very important movement. And so I don't want to question this. I think it's a very important uh, development uh, that in a social welfare state or that in a modern society we don't depend primarily on the mercy of others, but that we have so that we, c we can make certain legal claims, that we have certain well, responsibilities and, um, and duties, but also that we have, um, can expect um, to be supported in, in cases of need. And that, that this is not a question of mercy, that if you go to, um, if you are in a troubled situation and you go to an office or some kind of um, institution, uh, you don't depend on the civil servant's mercy. Yeah, it's not long ago that you know, this was the case. In totalitarian states, that's very often the case, that you depend on the mercy of someone or on this person accepting some additional money um, under the counter. But um, nowadays, you could say, ideally, in, um, um, the, uh, in a modern liberal society that's governed by the rule of law, um, you know, it's not a question of mercy, but a question of a legal claim. And that's an important um, development. So one could ask, why should we focus on mercy and thus on something extraordinary if it's better to use the language of justice and rights? Um, and I think this explains a little bit why there is a crisis of mercy in our society, because first of all, we have replaced mercy or we have um, a focus on human rights, a focus on um, the uh, question of justice, but it is, um, at least in German, the case, and in English as well, that the very word mercy is already very old-fashioned. So um, the word seems to be dependent on presuppositions that are no longer applicable or commonly accepted. So in German, very often, if you use the word mercy, it's used ironically. So let's have mercy on the last piece of cake uh, on the table you know, when you, when you um, uh, meet someone for coffee or cake. So uh, we use mercy very often um, either very critically or even ironically. It is then only possible to act mercifully as one takes pity on the cook and eats that last piece of cake. It is also possible to limit the demand to act mercifully to a small number, very, very small number, of extraordinary human beings who seem to have a specific inclination to act mercifully because of their nature, because of their religious or cultural upbringing or imprint. So most people then would say, well, I'm just following the rules of justice, um, but there are some people who should act mercifully. It's like Mother Teresa or some hero, some very famous, you know, people who, almost saints, who act mercifully, but it's not my responsibility. So we all can refrain from acting mercifully. Mercy then loses its universal significance. It's really very, very extraordinary then. But the question is, should not all human beings be capable of mercy and also act mercifully? And is mercy not today as important as in past times? Not just for people of uh, a certain religious belief, and is mercy not something different than a mere emotion and therefore can indeed be demanded and thus has an exemplary meaning? In order to answer these questions, I would like to focus on a number of fundamental questions regarding mer mercy. What is mercy? What happens if people act mercifully? What if they fail to do so? In raising these questions, I would like to exam examine the phenomenon of mercy from a philosophical standpoint. So what can we say about mercy philosophically? Without any doubt one has to think differently about divine mercy, but this is uh, not what I'm interested in um, tonight. So let me say a little bit about um, mercy now. First of all, I think it's reasonable to say that who thinks about mercy does not deal with an incidental phenomenon. One examines then how being human concretely happens and ought to happen, 
That is, one examines how human beings live, and that is to say, how they ought to act towards other human beings. So mercy concerns the interpersonal relation between human beings. And mercy concerns not an abstract relation, but human action. And I think this is why mercy and compassion, or mercy and an emotion of compassion, are very different. So we, we all know the situation, you know, we switch on the television and watch the news and we hear all these terrible news um, that hap- of things that have happened on the day in the world. And we have a lot of compassion. And it's easy, you know, it's easy to have compassion in an armchair. You know, to sit there and say, oh, this is really terrible what's happened today. The world is so bad. And then we go to our fridge and get another beer. And, uh, and five minutes later, we, we just... Yeah, forget about it. And I think that the point of mercy is, particularly if you look at the parable of the Good Samaritan, who acts mercifully, he's not just having compassion. He's, he's not saying, oh, this poor man who was robbed. He acts, so the action is very, very important. And I think this is somehow an element of a definition of mercy to say, well, mercy is not just a feeling, an emotion, but mercy means uh, implies that one acts in a specific manner. Um, so who does not act mercifully cannot be called merciful. We can call someone who doesn't act at all full of compassion. Yeah? We can imagine of someone who's full of compassion but doesn't do anything to change things. It's just looking at the world in this sort of manner of compassion. Um, one cannot be merciful, so in a purely abstract or theoretical sense. There is, as uh, Thomas Aquinas has shown, both affective and effective mercy. Or to put it more precisely, mercy, mercy is both affective, emotional, concerns our effects, and effective, so it leads to something. It is possible, however, to experience compassion, as I said, without acting on it. So one can look full of compassion at a homeless person without helping him him in any way, without even greeting him, and thus acknowledging the other person as a person. So compassion, I think, is a mere emotion, and different from mercy. Mercy lets someone not just feel something, it leads to action. In their actions, human beings can do something merciful. That is, they can perform an action that is widely considered merciful, such as feeding the hungry. But this is not really the essence of being merciful. It is possible to do something merciful in a very unmerciful manner. And this may be an explanation why mercy in the history has very often, in many languages, a bad reputation. There is what you could call mercy from above. You do something merciful, but you, do, you don't do it mercifully. And I think this is, particularly with respect to mercy, a problem. You can act justly, I think, and then this is where the inner attitude of someone doesn't matter so much. Or if you follow the law, yeah, let's say the traffic law, you know, the police doesn't care about whether you internally really fully agree with the traffic law as long as you just do what the traffic law requires you to do. But it's not about you know, whether you really, really say, oh, it's so meaningful just to drive at 70 kilometers an hour here. Yeah, maybe you're even tempted to drive faster. Yeah? But this is, not, this is where your internal attitude doesn't matter. But if it comes to mercy, this is very, very important. Yeah? It's not just important to act, to do merciful acts, but to act um, in a merciful manner, mercifully. So really merciful is someone who acts mercifully, that is, who does something that is not necessarily always considered merciful in a specific manner, so who acts out of mercy, full of mercy for another human being. For mercy primarily characterizes the relation between human beings. Whenever human beings act, however, they also do so freely. What does not happen out of free self-determination is not a real action. In addition, human beings can also, perhaps only after they have thought about it for some time, justify what they have done or haven't done. They can provide reasons for their actions and take responsibility for them. 
This is why mercy does not only presuppose human freedom, so it's whoever acts mercifully does it out of freedom. There's also um, a cognitive element to acting mercifully. Humans can provide reasons as to why they do what they do and why they act mercifully. It is important to think about how to provide the best possible help to another human being. So acting merciful is not just irrational, or it's not just an action coming out of an emotion. It's not just the heart that's concerned, it's the head as well. It's the thinking as well. And this is in the parable of the Good Samaritan uh, explained as well, because the Good Samaritan, you know, if you remember, uh, takes the victim of a robbery and, um, and takes care of him. So he brings him to, well, basically what would be today a hospital, but because there wasn't a hospital, it was a bed and breakfast, essentially. Uh, and he, he brought him there and he, he paid for it. And he said, look, if more money is needed, I come back and pay the money. So it's not an irrational action, it's not an irresponsible action, but he, he thinks about what is best to do, how can I best help the victim. So mercy does not only lead to action, but also, which is often forgotten, it leads to a prior thinking about how best to act. Mercy requires the head and the heart. Yet mercy is not merely a feature of human action that can be examined with no reference at all to the acting person. There are certain actions that show or express in a particular manner in a particular manner who someone is. So I could say they are actions that disclose the essence, the innermost character of a person. This is the case where mercy really happens. For in a truly merciful action, a human being is disclosed, or better, discloses himself or herself. So it's, this is why we cannot just focus on the action of acting mercifully, but also if mercy really happens, it tells us something about the person. Um, the person discloses himself or herself. And in doing so, he does not show a feature or characteristic trait that is typical of human beings in general, like someone who calculates, shows that human beings are capable of calculation. The act of mercy does not show what he is as a human being as such, but who he is as a concrete person. This is why one can argue that mercy is a char characteristic feature or habit of persons. Only if a human being who acts is habitually really merciful, his actions too, can also fully or in the proper sense be called merciful, and vice versa. So it doesn't depend so much on the action, it depends on the person. Otherwise, the actions or the person only seem to be merciful. Something must have happened, therefore, in the acting person's heart. This must have moved him to act. The Latin word misericordia, or the German word barmherzigkeit, show this relation of mercy to the heart, the inner essence or the character of the human being very clearly. So mercy can be considered a feature of a person's character. And this is why there are no objective scientific criteria for works of mercy. And this is why psychologists fail to explain mercy or to uh, start an empirical research on you know, the essence of mercy. It's not possible, I'm afraid. Or let's say, thank God it's not possible because um, you, know, you can't simply... With justice it's partly different. You, know, you can sort of say or with other moral features. You, know, you can sort of do some empirical research. With mercy, it doesn't um, matter. Even if someone explains his action with reference to the demand to act mercifully, other motives can have played a decisive role. It could be the case that mercy did play no role at all in his or her decision to act. Someone could have wanted to seem merciful. He helped needy and distressed people, only to be praised or to receive a national award. It's possible. We, we, and somehow, if you think about this, it may mean that we can never be sure that another person has really acted mercifully. Maybe it's uh, you know, education or religion or expectation to, do, to get something and so on. Someone else could mistake another motivation to act with mercy. It could be that he or she does not really know what mercy is. Who visits imprisoned people could actually, even though he thinks that he's a merciful person, be curious about life, uh, the life in a prison or the encounter with criminals. He could really look for something to do because of his boredom. 
or merely follow social practices. Many people do something good or pro bono simply because they have always done, done so or because other people have done so and do the same. Thus, who feeds the hungry, even though this is considered an act of mercy, does not necessarily act mercifully, even if his or her action looks as if he or she was merciful, or how one, perhaps even the acting person himself, imagines something merciful to look like. The character, that is, who someone really and deeply is, and the manner in which one acts, evades any attempt to determine it unambiguously. This is not to say that there is no real mercy at all. So now someone could say, well, if we don't have any proper criterion, maybe there is no mercy at all. It always looks like mercy. It means, so this is not to say that there is no mercy at all, but it means that it is only possible to speak of works of mercy with a certain uncertainty. For one can never look into the heart of another human being. It's the heart, the inner attitude that counts. This is where every human being is alone with himself and his God. One can only, because of external signs, suppose that something is really a work of mercy, that a human being has really and not just seemingly acted mercifully. There are sometimes very, very radical signs, and they allow for the hope that there are really merciful human beings. If one speaks of a demand of mercy, this cannot mean that such a demand is to be understood like the kind of universal moral law the observance of which can one, uh, one can determine with respect to external criteria. Mercy is nothing ordinary. To speak of a demand to act mercifully can only mean not to draw attention to the ordinary, but to the extraordinary way of human life. And one can only hope that one is also capable of doing so. So it's not, it's another misunderstanding of mercy if I reduce mercy to a universal law or say mercy is a universal law, we all have to act mercifully, then I also misunderstand what mercy is because it can't be a universal moral law, it's the extraordinary. In the proper meaning of the word, only human beings have a character, even though one sometimes speaks of the character of a dog or a landscape, but one then refers to the nature of the dog or the landscape. Other than animals, human beings can relate to their own nature, to what they are. They can develop a second nature, a character. For this reason, human beings are called persons. It may be that certain animals, such as higher primates or dolphins, too, are persons. With most animals, this is evidently not the case. Dogs cannot freely relate to what they are. It is not possible for dogs to make you know, a proper decision as to whether or not, they want to follow their impulses and desires. Dogs do not fast. Culture begins where freedom makes it possible to relate oneself to the immediacy of one's drives and not to follow them, for example. Yeah, maybe you feel a little hungry now or thirsty, so because of um, the civilized manner and the culture in uh, our world, you say, okay, I, I remain here until the lecture is over, um, so I don't need to react immediately on my drive. This is why education of animals is fundamentally different from education of human beings. And this is how the human being develops habits such as the ones that allow him or her to do works of mercy. Therefore, animals, possible exceptions notwithstanding, cannot be merciful or act mercifully. Nevertheless, some animals can experience compassion. So this is again um, a way of looking at mercy from a different angle because some people say, oh, mercy is simply the same as compassion. And I think, well, it's important to, to, to really look at this uh, conceptual difference between mercy and compassion. There's no question that animals can experience compassion, what seems to us as you know, compassion, something like compassion. That is an emotion that lies in experiencing the suffering of another being as if, it, as if it was one's own suffering, and thus in suffering together with the other human being. One needs to say something like compassion here, because we don't really know what it means for a dog to experience compassion. But I think we have very strong reasons to assume that it is something like compassion that a dog experiences if he sees another suffering dog. The inner life of an animal is of course not immediately accessible to us, 
but we can interpret external signs in an analogy to our own experience. It is, however, possible for human beings to treat animals mercifully. But I would say this has a meaning different from mercy for human beings. If a human being sees a dog that seems to be sad or is suffering, it is not possible for the, other human, for the human being fully to understand the dog's sadness or the do dog's suffering. One can only suppose what it means for a dog to be sad and, in a limited way, suffer together with a sad dog and act mercifully for him. To nature, as such, one can only relate mercifully in a metaphorical sense, because nature itself does not have a heart that can suffer. Or, you know. This is how one speaks of mercy for the oppressed nature. This does not, however, rule out that it is possible to formulate duties against nature. So we can talk about duties against nature, but I think when we talk about mercy, we can only talk in a very sort of analogous way of, about mercy towards nature. I think what mercy presupposes is an encounter on the level of the heart, between an encounter between human beings, between persons. It thus presupposes empathy with the inner life of another human being. This is why mercy, first of all, happens between human beings. God does not need human mercy, as Aquinas has emphasized, and in a certain way we could say dogs in nature you can only receive mercy in a sort of analogous manner. Even though one does not exactly know what it means to be another person, it is possible to empathize with the other human person and to share his or her suffering in order to act mercifully. And the reason is that one shares one's human nature. If another human being suffers from a serious illness, one can sympathize with him or her and show mercy because one has already oneself gone through illness, one has already oneself thought about a future um, sickness or death and can therefore share the experience of being ill by analogy. Thus mercy presupposes a fundamental equality among all human beings as persons. One could even argue that mercy leads us to a deeper understanding of what it means not only to be human but to be a person. Persons are required to rela relate to one another in a merciful manner. Mercy is thus also an act of recognition of the other as a person. It is thus particularly the weak, suffering and wounded other human being who shows us who a person is. So it's not the strong, and this is why Nietzsche was so much against it. But we could say, well, it's a suffering, the weak human being that in a particular manner shows us who a person is. Yet there are forms of merciful action that do not acknowledge this kind of equality. I mean, first of all, there seems to be a fundamental equality that's presupposed by mercy. But there are certain acts of mercy that do not acknowledge this kind of equality. Particularly because the human being who needs mercy is in a weak position, you know, for he's hungry or thirsty, in prison sick, a stranger or sad, it is possible that the merciful relation to him turns into a position of power. Care for another human being that leaves him his proper space and lets him be free himself or herself can qu quickly turn into a kind of care that does not, as it were, allow the other to breathe, to be as self. The other human being is treated from above. One does not act with or for him, but rather towards him. It is also possible to overlook the equality of the other if one does not act even though one experiences some kind of feeling. The adjective compassionate can sometimes refer to this kind of unequal or superficial relation to the other, if one speaks, for example, of one's compassion for a homeless person. Then the inequality between the one who takes pity and the other person who receives pity stands in the foreground. If something is being done at all, the other person becomes an object of only supposed merciful action. Mercy can also quickly freeze, as it were, and lead not only to a position of power, but also to a mere routine that reduces suffering without allowing a real encounter with a suffering person. I mean, think about a hospital. You know, in a hospital, you have, of course, many professional requirements, but you could say in many cases, um, the origins of many hospitals you know, are, for example, the love to the neighbor, you know, the important um, hospital in Berlin is called Charité. So, not justice, 
it's charité. So it's you know, looking for the sick is an act of love. But this love can very easily, like um, mercy as well, become sterile, cold, distant, and that's a, pr a problem um, as well. What is missing in this kind of merciful behavior is nothing accidental. But what is most important in the event of mercy, and I think it's proper to speak of an event of mercy, yeah, it's nothing that can be foreseen, that can be deduced, that can be regulated, it happens un in an unforeseeable manner. It's a real empathy with and a real being touched by the suffering other person. This is why the works of mercy must not be limited to material or external goods, like just food or water or an external visit in the prison. Their end is not simply to provide food or drink, clothes or a roof over one's head. Something different stands in the foreground of real compassion and mercy. It is the deeply human turn towards the other. One heart encounters another. This can happen in a friendly look at the other. So it doesn't need to be um, a big kind of action. Yeah, it can be a friendly look at the other, in a true word, in the interest in what the other wants to say, in a gentle touch or a hearty embrace. Without this kind of mercy, there is no real being together of human beings. There is no real being for another. For every human being who is being helped mercifully also, give, also gives something to the one who has mercifully given something to him. And this is where I think it's interesting to think um, very briefly about the relation of justice and mercy. Think about a fully just society. Yeah, where basically justice is, I mean, it's of course a utopian society, but uh, let's say it's full, fully just society. Whatever we think about justice is realized. Who would like to live in a fully, but only just society? With no mercy. <laughs> yeah? So I think no one would want to live there. You know? We We know that justice is important. But justice is formal. Justice doesn't deep, doesn't look at the uh, concrete individual. Yeah? From the perspective of justice, we are mere examples you know, of human beings. Mercy focuses on the particular. And even in um, a completely just society, uh, we would still have suffering. We would still have um, wounded people. We would still have uh, something that could not be regulated by justice. It would be very strange if you could say, you know, we, we all depend on you know, the kindness of strangers. Yeah? Sometimes you walk along the street and all you need is someone just looking at you and saying hello. <laughs> uh, and that's all. This can be an act of mercy. And we walk alongside and we don't take care of one another, we don't look at one another. That's very unmerciful. And it happens to all of us but, it's, um, but we can't simply say, by law, you have to greet your neighbor. Uh, whoever pass, yeah, passes. We have many laws that tell us, yeah, don't throw your kind of um, empty bottles on the street and so on. So, but, but it would be ridiculous. We couldn't say, oh, we, we, turn, we also have to turn this into a demand of justice. Yeah? Greet your neighbors, be friendly, be kind. Yeah? I mean, it's not a question of justice. For proper human life, we need some, this extraordinary element. And also, if you have a neighbor who you know, constantly greets you very in a very friendly manner, and it's not honest, yeah, it doesn't. This is the kind of you know, greeting that you don't want. Yeah, you want the sort of a recognition of you as a person. So, however, who acts mercifully because he feels better afterwards? Right? There are these people, or because he or she receives gratefulness or anything else, does not act mercifully. And it is also important to note that whenever one acts mercifully, one does not merely give something. I think that's a, a very common misunderstanding. One always gives oneself. One person freely gives him or herself to another free person. Here I am, there for you. So mercy is an act of giving, but not of just giving something, but oneself. That's the sort of the interpersonal encounter in the act of mercy. In this giving oneself, the time with the other human person can turn into a shared and common time if the hearts really touch one another. Time then turns into the time of the shared hope that all will be well. So in the act of mercy, one transcends, that is, 
one goes beyond oneself. And maybe this is why mercy today seems to be so difficult, because we live in a culture that um, adores selfishness and supports selfishness, so we focus on, on just the self, our own self. But mercy is an act of transcendence, yeah? transcending oneself towards another human being. One transcends oneself, but not just towards another human being, but also towards a new we, a new community. It's not just I and thou, but it's a new we, a new community that comes into existence. And one transcends oneself, if one acts mercifully, to a common future, and maybe even to God, who shows himself in the face of the other. Yet, particularly the relation with and for one another, the symmetry between the one and the other shows an underlying asymmetry that is essential for any act of mercy. Until now, mercy has been described as an act of freedom. So human beings you know, mer act mercifully only if they act freely. Yet this cannot be the last word about mercy. For the free decision to act mercifully is the answer to a call to act mercifully. The responsibility for the other human being, it seems, is prior to one's own freedom. Only because the other human being calls me and articulates a concrete claim, my heart is being touched and moved to act. I'm not following a principle. Yeah? So in terms of justice, you can say, oh, it's my principle always. I know some people who say, well, there's so many homeless people. I really want to help them, but I can't help all of them. So every day uh, I have uh, you know, 250 cent or two euro coins in my pocket. And the first two homeless po people who, who ask me for money get some money. You could say yeah, he makes mercy then he deals with the extraordinary situation by turning it into an ordinary situation into a question of justice to say, yeah, this is my principle. If, you know, the third person comes to me, bad luck. No? He or she yeah, should have come a little earlier. And it's a way of dealing with this situ situation when we realize, well, maybe you could justify it as, as an act of justice then, because he could say, well, I have limited resources, I need to have some kind of principle on as to how to deal with my resources. But the act of mercy, um, it, 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 acting merciful is not acting on some specific kind of principle. That's why it's an event of mercy. One is being called to do something. One is being touched, called by the other person. The other person shows him or herself in his or her misery, naked, vulnerable, and in need. And this is a meaningful self-disclosing as well. Who acts mercifully is therefore first of all an addressee, addressed by the call of the other human being. The claim of the other can be so radical that mercy leads to a deep entanglement into the destiny of the other. One cannot otherwise than turning towards the other. One is being wounded by the other so much that there can also be a destructive, devastating power of mercy. Elias Canetti once wrote, mercy is a flooding and fully destroys him. So there is this sort of element of mercy there as well. This is only at first sight cryptic. The compassionate view from above does not know this kind of flooding. However, who has been really touched in his heart knows that possibly afterwards nothing is as it used to be. One is destroyed in one's autonomy and self-confidence. One has become another human being. One lives now for the other and from the other. So the relation has changed. So while many people think the asymmetry in mercy is that there's a subject that can act mercifully because he or she has food or what and can give it to the other person who's in need, I think this suggests another asymmetry that basically the person, the victim, calls um, the other human being, touches the other human being to help him. So it's um, an, another um, relation here. It is possible to demand um, justice, but I, I don't think it is possible to demand um, uh, a mercy as well. Um, I just summarize this here. I think if we look at the legal system, as I already said, it's important that 
what used to be work, a work of mercy or many works of mercy are now claims of justice, have been basically legalized, have been put into a legal context. And that's really an advance. But at the same time, um, it seems um, important to see that um, mercy and justice are complementary phenomena. Also, Aquinas again says, justice without mercy is cruel. Yeah. Just mere justice is just formal justice. If there's no mercy there at all, this is cruel. Um, and I think this is almost self-evident, um, and this is why I'm surprised there isn't much um, work being done in philosophy on mercy, even though this is such a human phenomenon. An example that I use to explain this relation between justice and mercy is, think about a school teacher. A school teacher has to submit grades twice a year, normally. Um, and of course, the grades should be just. Yeah, I mean, if you tell a, a school class, well, you all get, you will all get A's or you know first grade, um, they normally don't complain. But if they think about it, uh, well, it's of course not just. You know, it's the same as saying you will all get F's, you will fail, or you will all get five, get grade five or six, the worst grade. I mean, then they complain, but it's equally un unjust. So they expect, first of all, just grades. But every teacher knows that sometimes, and this is, I think, self-evident, that there may be certain cases where if you do as a teacher the calculation, you realize, for example, this the student or this pupil gets um, you know, such and such a grade, but you know that there was some big problem in the family or that the student has now much better grades than in the beginning of the semester. Or yeah, You know, there may be certain circumstances that justify you not just to calculate mathematically a grade, but also to grade mercifully. And it doesn't contradict justice. And we would say, no, this is important because otherwise you know, just computers could do the grading or could um, calculate the grades. You know, this is where a hermeneutic understanding is necessary of a specific person, a specific situation. But this, but th this pupil could not have a claim, could not say, look, I know uh, mathematically you calculated my grade correctly, but you should have exercised mercy. There's no, you should have exercised mercy. Because then, of course, it's no mercy, then uh, it doesn't work. But this is an example from the everyday world, everyday life, where we can see, yeah, however important justice is, particularly in our modern society, there's always need um, for mercy as well. And without uh, mercy, justice would be cruel. But also, you could say, um, uh, without um, uh, justice, mercy would just be blind as well. Only mercy is very, very dangerous as well. Because that's the um, that's one reason why um, mercy has such a bad reputation as well. If you think of the uh, time of absolutism or totalitarian regimes, totalitarian regimes always use mercy as well. So they people know they're dependent on mercy. So that's the irrational, not foreseeable element. And this is where one should say no. Just mercy is not sufficient. We need more than just mercy. I am coming to an end now. Sometimes conditions for merciful actions are imposed on another suffering human being. One promises help if he or she does as one wishes. We know this as well. Sometimes parents use uh, this in the educational program, um, um, but it's somewhere in between just justice and mercy then. In the sphere of justice, this is possible. Yeah? Legal claims are related to legal duties. Yeah, we pay taxes, and uh, that's a duty, so we, it's not an act of mercy. But then we, we have certain legal rights as well. So, however, real merciful action cannot be subject to conditions. It happens out of freedom and responsibility, merely for the sake of the other human being, not even for the sake of acting to a specific principle. And this would undermine the act of mercy. Yeah? If, if someone had interviewed the Good Samaritan after he, he had helped the victim and if he had said, well, my principle is such and such, we would still think very highly of him, but in a different manner. We would say, well, he just follows his principles. But the act of mercy is extraordinary. This is why one is not allowed to take advantage from merciful action and must not hope to do so. One can call this the purity or selflessness of mercy. All human beings can act to their own advantage. This is part of their nature. And this is how human beings act in the first instance. Yeah. Acting for one's own advantage. 
One does not need examples or many role models to do so. This is part of our nature. The extraordinary is in need of role models. Such a role model is the Good Samaritan, for he acted against the selfish impulse to look away, to continue to walk, and to hope that all is not as bad as it looks, and that some other people will take care of a wounded stranger. We have all these, in, I mean, everyone knows this, we have all these internal yeah, ideas going on. Now, someone else will look, now, I don't really have time, I get dirty and I have an appointment, yeah, I need to see my friends, I don't need to help. So this is the basically the natural, the ordinary. Um, but the extraordinary, I could say in helping the victim, and this is the extraordinary help, a relation was established that he could not easily undo and that he could not easily invade the, the person who acted mercifully. The Good Samaritan, as an example, um, was wounded himself, got involved with another human being and became part of a shared history with him. He did not simply care for what was immediately necessary, but took on a deeper, a deeper responsibility. He did not pursue any other purpose than helping another stranded human being and joining in his need such that he related to it as if it was his own need. This is not to say, however, that the Good Samaritan acted for the purpose of mercy. Merciful action is no end in itself. Then the concrete human being would be a means for the end of mercy that could, in principle, be exchanged and that would allow another human being to act mercifully. Mercy, then, would become an ideology, an abstract idea or principle to which human beings in need are being subordinated. As soon as mercy turns into this kind of idea, the works that are performed in its name are no longer merciful. They only seem to be so. This is what one could call the fragile character of mercy. You know, the event of mercy that if you want to catch it, if you want to even justify it and determine it and uh, make it a principle, it just evades, it vanishes. Real mercy is not concerned with mercy as a general feature, but with another concrete human person who is not understood as a means, but as the only end of the action. The other human being is not merely an example of the species of human beings then. He or she does not stand for humanity or mankind as such, but simply for himself or for herself, a suffering human being who is in need of mercy, not in general, but in a particular concrete situation. In this concrete situation, mercy establishes something new that actually, as possibility prior to the work of mercy, had already been there. Proximity. Proximity is perhaps another word for mercy. Where mercy really happens, human beings encounter one another as neighbors, even though they may be strangers, but they encounter one another as suddenly as neighbors. They accept full of gratitude the present of their presence, and they come close to one another in their flesh, in their bodily character, not as abstract subjects. And as every bodily encounter, the proximity of mercy too stands in the horizon of finitude. However much one helps another human being, however much one suffers with him or experiences in one's own suffering, help and support, death too remains always present. Yet because of its power that is for the most part quiet and reaches mysteriously into one's life, mercy does not become meaningless vis-a-vis -vis death. For in the very act of mercy, in being with and for another concrete human being, one can see a gentle, sometimes defiant, sometimes restrained and humble resistance against the enormous necessity of suffering and dying. A resistance against the finitude of human existence. And wherever human beings offer this kind of resistance, wherever they refuse to give the last word to an inevitable nothingness, and wherever they come without considering the consequences close to one another, the sometimes old-fashioned hope may be affirmed once again that the tragedians and pessimists are not right and that ultimately good and not bad is carried on. Nevertheless, one cannot understand this in such a way that one can be triumphant, but merely so that for a short moment, short event, one can see the shadow of a memory that all human beings, even if often hidden and forgotten, carry in their hearts. 
a memory of goodness that was once present in an unpreconceivable, a deep past, as it were, or what is the same in a future that will always remain future. So in the act, in the event of mercy, something opens up, a memory of this deep past or a future of a kindness between human beings. Now I could say this is the utopian or eschatological dimension of mercy. And wherever mercy happens, and who could know for sure that it ever happened, wherever hope speaks of the reality of mercy, an abyss opens up. It is the abyss of a good that evades any attempt at explaining it, and furthermore, any attempt at really expressing it. This is why real mercy makes one speechless. Shyly, mercy moves away from the light of public attention and retreats into silence and hiddenness. For it does not know what it really is. It can't define or determine itself. Neither does it care about it. It simply must happen, suddenly, freely, with no external reasons, in an event that is not at all necessary, but grabs one and the other and lets them be thankful and transcends themselves. And this is good as it is. Thank you very much.